what am I doing here? Well, I'm actually a fertility specialist. And I wanted to invite you to share some of my journey with you over here, the one that I've been through towards the Australian dream. When I started in reproductive medicine about 20 years ago, it was all about uh, pregnancy and achieving conception. And it was really only much more recently that I've actually become aware that what the people who were coming to see me and the couples who were coming to see me were not so much after a baby, but it was about achieving their dream of a family. And that got me interested in the concept of the family. And the concept of the family, or the definition of family, is usually defined based on blood, on inheritance, and on genetics. And this is the sort of concept of the typical family that's uh, propagated. Where does this come from? Well, to look and where we get this concept from, we really need to go back and look at a little bit of reproductive biology. For women, the fertility paradigm was that once they reached maturity, then it was really time for conception and from there on birth. Women were designed to have their first periods in their late teens, and then really to be pregnant or breastfeeding most of their lives until the end of their reproductive time, which was usually in the late 30s. This is the fertility paradigm that we as humans have in fact been brought up with. The concept of having a monthly period is really a very modern one and is not what humans were designed to do. As part of this, I'm going to take you through to Queen Victoria over here. And this is her, a very famous portrait of her standing there with her descendants. Queen Victoria, this, this pedigree here, is interesting for a number of reasons. Firstly is uh, Queen Victoria was in fact the index case for a particular type of mutation called haemophilia and she spread this disorder through as the uh, Windsor family um, was married out throughout the European royal houses and um, spread this through a number of dynasties and in fact arguably was responsible for the downfall of the Romanov Empire. But secondly it's important because you can see that Queen Victoria had nine children. Now, Queen Victoria hated being pregnant. She abhorred breastfeeding and she thought that newborn were ugly and were a complete waste of time. <laughs> Despite that, she had nine children. Now, if Queen Victoria could have, she would have reached for contraception. The oral contraceptive pill was released to the market in 1960 and it was a revolution. For the very first time, women took control of their sexuality and there was a dissociation between sexuality and reproduction. And this led to fundamental changes. In the 60s, towards the end of the 60s, the early 70s, the average, the average, um, uh, the average age of a woman having her first child was just under the age of 25. By 2007, in fact, this has risen to 31. You can see the age, the average age of a male parallels that of a woman by about two years. And that's because we do what women tell us to do. Um, <laughs> when women have finished with contraception, then the concept is here that we really want to go to contraception, and preferably this is a fertility switch. And if it doesn't quite happen, then we resort to assisted conception as soon as possible. But sometimes this switch doesn't flick. And there are various reasons for that. I want to take you through my own, I'm, I'm a child of the 60s, I'm going to take you through what's happened to population growth over the last 40 years. You will see over here that most children in society are born to women in their early 20s, uh, in the 60s, and then a smaller amount to the 30s, but you see that the number of children born to older women drops off quite significantly. There's a significant drop in fertility in the mid-30s, and then it slows down to a trickle really in their 40s, and in the late 40s it really stops. As we go through the decades, you see that there's a shift. Now, mothers are becoming older. We see more women having children in their 30s. But overall, notice that, in fact, the size of families or the number of children that people have is reducing quite significantly over the last four decades. But the shift is still there. We still see a drop in fertility at starting at the age of 30 with a significant drop at the age of 35 and a massive drop at the age of 40. When I show this to people in sort of educational fora, I get, well, so what? You know, if need be, I'll access IVF. This is where the problem arises. We have exactly the same problems when people go to assisted reproduction. When people access IVF, we can reliably achieve a pregnancy rate of over 50% in the 20 to under 30 year old age group. At the age of 35, this pregnancy rate drops down to uh, just under 40%. When you're 40, this pregnancy rate may be about 15%. 
when you're 42, the chance of conceiving becomes about one to two uh, in 100, and over the age of 45, it's really no longer possible, even with assistive reproduction. Why does this happen? Well, from that point of view, you need to understand a little bit about female biology. And unlike women, men are the ultimate multitaskers. While I'm standing here, I'm producing 200 sperm every single second. <laughs> Women, on the other hand, only produce eggs once in their lifetime. The maximum egg count occurred when you were about seven months in your own mother's abdomen. By the time you were born, this had already dropped to less than half of that, and you only have three million eggs left. By the time women go through puberty, there are only about a million eggs left. And then over a course of their lifetime, that then reduces to a supply that is no longer usable by the time of menopause. So women only ever use, or potentially use, only about two to 300 eggs over the whole of their lifetime, what I produce in two seconds. <laughs> now, we can assess this. We can assess to see how many eggs there are left in a, in a woman's lifetime by two very simple tests. There is a blood test available, and there is an ultrasound scan available that can be organized by your primary care provider or by your GP. These are easily accessible. You can walk down the corner and everyone get this. And this is our first action point. I think we need to promote the idea that fertility is not unlimited, and that fertility unfortunately has an expiry date. And should you decide that you want to delay childbearing for whatever reasons, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a moment, that there are opportunities for making assessments. Now, should you, for example, have this test done and find that your reproductive capacity is significantly lower than would be expected for someone in your age group, then you do have some options over here. And I'm going to put all of these options under the banner of IVF because the term assisted reproduction is just a little bit too large. IVF allows for delayed reproduction, for example, for lifestyle or for professional choices. It allows younger women to delay, to delay childbearing until such time as they are ready. If I take the eggs from a 30-year-old, her chance of conception, which is close to or just over 50% with IVF, will remain fixed regardless of when we put those eggs or embryos back, whether that's at the age of 40, 50, 60 or 70. Don't recommend the last two, but in fact, the chance of conception remains the same. Secondly, IVF allows us, and this is a population that we're seeing more and more, allows people who are forced into uh, delaying their conception, it gives them some options. What we see most commonly are things such as uh, breast cancer, uh, disease of reproductive age women. The diagnosis of cancer is often a double-edged sword. Not only is it the implication of what this diagnosis means for the woman herself, but also often the treatment actually puts an end to her reproductive capacity. So therefore, if we freeze eggs or we freeze embryos for people later on, it gives them the opportunity to conceive when it's right. The other thing that we're seeing more and more in our practices, we're seeing access by single women and by same-sex couples. And this really means that we've seen a significant shift in the composition of the Australian family. This graph demonstrates that, in fact, in Australia, um, the type of family that we were talking about before is significantly reducing. The, there are less and less couples with uh, children, there are many more uh, singles, and there are many more couples without children constituting the Australian family. And you can see from this graph over here that in fact the couple with children now only makes up 44% of Australian families. Out of those, a significant number will be non-biological families, meaning that there's either been a separation or there's an adopted child or something else in there. So the picture that emerges here is really that this is no longer the picture of the contemporary Australian family. And in fact, that we probably look much more like this. This is the image of the contemporary Australian family. And this, these images come from mums and papas who are makers of uh, strollers and of prams. And obviously they've caught on to this fact because this is their market. These are the people that they're looking to. So the contemporary Australian family consists of an older mother, an older father, single parents, same-sex parents, adopted and donated families, grandparents, and blended families. This is what makes up the family now. So I think it's time to be left behind this definition based on genetics and on bloodlines and really focus on a definition that's much more 
uh, appropriate to our current setting, which is that a family is defined by the relationships between its members rather than anything else. So, what does this mean for the contemporary Australian family? First thing is, there is a right to recognition. Article 16 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations says that men and women of full age have the right to marry and found a family, and that a society is entitled to protection, and that a family is entitled to protection by society and state. And this is our second point here today. It is absolutely unacceptable that in Australia in 2014 we do not have legislative protection for contemporary Australian families. Rather than that, we, we're subject to a parliament which imposes upon us an 18th century concept of a family that does no longer exist. It's time to stop the discrimination that we're all subject to at the moment. Second thing is that Australian families... <laughs> Australian families need support. They need access to reproductive services, they need access to parental leave, and they need access to childcare. Why do they do that? Well, there are a number of countries that have experimented with this. How do you promote growth in the population? If you run a campaign, if you run ads that tell 20-year-olds, well, you should be thinking about having a baby now, it doesn't work. There's a reason why they're not having a baby, because they don't want to at this point. But we know that if you want to grow your population, then you need to give them the things that they need, which means access to reproductive services, it means that single mothers need, or, or that uh, couples need to have access to appropriate parental leave, and that we need to have access to childcare. A single mother who's going to be uh, at home with her child cannot return to the workforce if there's not going to be someone there to help support her. Of course, the almighty dollar is always the argument here, but there are two reasons for why we have to provide the support. And the first one is demographic ageing. I'm here to tell you that the issue of overpopulating the world is non-existent. Most nations in the world are in a negative growth. We're the uh, Dan Brown type of scenario in his most recent book is non-existent. We're not going to see an overpopulation of the world. Most developed countries are in a rapid negative growth and some of them are in fact declining at a massive rate. What is also changing is that the proportion of older people within the society is increasing. So we're having a very large base, because we're all living longer, we have a very large base of older Australians who are going to need a younger population, which is shrinking at the moment, to support them later on in life. And that is all of us over here. We are going to need the support of the younger generation to help us through this. So for that reason, we have to provide these services. The second is a much more pragmatic one which is that, in fact, for every single person born, there is a significant return to the state in terms of tax. So the net return for all of these services, it's a paltry amount of money to spend on parental leave and childcare for the return that the, that the government is going to get for every single taxpayer. So there is no reason to discriminate in this situation. So what are the challenges? The challenges are... Firstly, we need to understand that contemporary Australian families are defined by their relationships and not by genetics and not by biology. We need to promote the concept that fertility is time-limited, but that assessment is possible. We need to recognise the nature of the current Australian family structure, and this requires legislative support. And finally, we need to institute appropriate support for the contemporary Australian family. Thank you.